Welcome to Season 2 of Conscious Conversations, where we aim to inspire deep and meaningful interactions that grow into a community of practice that is committed to healing, resilience and expansion. In this season, our focus is on Africa, the fountain of humanity, the Great Mother Africa, a land research is increasingly confirming to be home of the first humans to evolve. Research also confirms that early humans migrated out of Africa into Asia about 2 million years ago and into Europe about 1.5 million years ago. The long and short of it, Africa is where it started. In this season's Conscious Conversations, we speak with spiritual teachers and thought leaders about the ways in which we can unearth the wisdom of the old that calls us back to listen, learn, remember, restore and heal. I am Maba Tomunzi. Welcome. African people have for many years lived having to suppress who they were, whether it be through the expression of their languages, traditions, culture, or simply their way of being. There exist deep connections between Black South Africans and Black Americans because of our shared long history of racial segregation and white supremacy, where entire societies were structured against the Black community, which meant no economic, social, and cultural power. The cultural legacies of this history have influenced how the stories of black people have been portrayed in the media, which has often meant being inferior and unacceptable. While institutionalized racial segregation ended in 1964 in the United States of America and in 1994 in South Africa, we see how media, ideology, and popular culture continue to portray black people as inferior with certain stereotypes that propagate controversial and misconstrued images of what it means to be black. In this conversation, we speak to Joy Donnell about how we as black people can reframe the narrative around what it means to be black by telling our stories in an authentic way ultimately redefining what it means to be black. Joy Donnell is a producer and writer dedicated to creating media that builds cultural legacy. She believes in owning your power, and for Joy, power is owning your voice, image, narrative, influence, and intentions. Joy's work actively combines publicity, content strategy, and media to build the legacy and expand awareness. Good morning, Joy. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. Oh, good morning. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to ask you to just share a little bit about um, yourself. You've been in the media space for a number of years. Um, what has that been like Um how did you start your career, particularly as a black woman in Holyhood? Um, yeah. Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, sometimes I forget what a journey it has been. I was always naturally a storyteller. I was always writing. I was always doing uh, oratory type of work and presentations and things like that. And like a lot of kids growing up in the United States, I was always watching something, right? Like I was watching television. I was into uh, movies. And one day I started looking around and realizing that a lot of the movies I was consuming, a lot of the television that I was looking at wasn't reflecting an image of me back to myself, and I started to ask questions about why that is. And it took years, it took decades, really, to start to get a full picture answer around it. Uh, James Baldwin, who is a very famous writer, he had uh, a statement that he had made about where he would be watching the cowboy and Indian movies. And he would be rooting for Gary Cooper 
And then one day he realized that he was not Gary Cooper in the eyes of the country he was growing up in, that he was the Indian Mm -hmm. and he was the, the enemy to be destroyed, to be annihilated. And I started to pick up on these really weird things within media. And gradually, I just wanted to start making my own content and telling my own stories and having a a conversation that was more restorative and healing. So I ended up going into Hollywood, going into uh, this type of visual storytelling and writing in a different way because I could not find the things that I was looking for. And even now I approach it most of the time with thinking when I was seven, when I was 10, when I was 14, you know, what are the stories that that version of joy would have loved to have stumbled upon and would have been beneficial to her? So I'm my first audience and I, I tell stories to heal certain parts of myself, expand certain parts of myself that never got fed by the environment that I was growing up in and doing my best to try to not just survive, but hoping to thrive within. Mm. So we speak a lot about the media. Uh, Now the word social media, you know, it's on everybody's lips. But what is the media really? And how can black people use the media to share their stories? Well, I think now media is everything. I think that media has become a basic human need at this point, even though we don't talk about it, is going to be very difficult for you to compete the way that you need to compete within the workforce or business, uh, get the kind of education that you're looking for. If you don't have access to the internet, if you don't have access to certain forms of media. So media started with things like cave paintings, right? Uh, Even bronzes and things like that. All of those art forms were a way of communicating a message, a story, something about a culture of people, their philosophy, That's what media is. But now we've gotten beyond even the printing press and books and newspapers and television and movies. And we've got media right on our phones, right? So we don't even have to go to a a special ceremonial place, if you will. We don't have to have this kind of ritualistic journey to the media that we consume, like when we would go to a movie theater. You can just pick up your phone and the media is coming through that. I see it as a stream of energy and the energy obeys the laws of the form it takes. So, for example, if you are on Twitter, which is a media platform, You've got a certain amount of characters with which you can express yourself, right? It's very different than Facebook where you can go on and on and on Mm. for a longer period of time inside of that post and almost micro blog, Mm -hmm. if you will. But Twitter is very short bursts of information that come across as breaking news, Almost. That's actually even the way that it is kind of presented on the platform. This is news right now. Instagram works that same way, but visually, whereas Twitter is within words. I'm breaking this down like this because that's what I mean by the energy obeys the laws of the form it takes. You're not going to express what you're trying to express the same way on Twitter Mm -hmm. as you would on Instagram because Instagram is visual and Twitter, you don't necessarily have to have the visual aspect, but you've got to have the words make sense within the character account that you're allotted. So if you start to understand that all of this access to media all of these platforms that we have access to now that we did not have access to before operate in very particular ways. They have rules with which they have crafted things. Then you can start to look at what are the rivers of information available to me (coughs) to go ahead and put a message out. What are the topics 
that I want to actually really like take a a look at expressing myself through. And then you just kind of see how they are presented, how that energy flows on those particular media platforms. And then you redirect the stream. I'm not into trying to swim upstream. I don't want to go with the flow either. Mm -hmm. I want to redirect the stream of energy. And so when I talk to people about their unique message, like what it is that they want to put out into the world, to say, look at what people believe they know about the thing that you want to discuss, express, share. There is a, an idea, right? Mm-hmm. People have a perception about it. What you do to start to create your own real estate around that particular thing that is distinctly yours is that you jump into the perception of what people believe about a particular thing and then you disrupt it with your unique perspective. Mm. So for example, I've been talking to you about media, right? Something that we are familiar with social media, but I'm disrupting the way that we have been taught to think about these media platforms with my unique perspective Mm. around these platforms and how to see them for what they are, see the opportunity within them, not just, you know, belly ache and yearn for what it could be or how it should be. Perhaps if you are looking at it from the aspect of your unique perspective, you might see the opportunity that no one else was seeing within Mm -hmm. that platform to utilize it for what you need to utilize it for. And this is why we've even seen around the world, people went on to uh, Twitter and different platforms, Instagram and whatnot, and actually organized Mm. for civil, you know, like for actually civil change, for social change, where before the leaders that we had before, they didn't have social media Mm. to organize on, uh, to get a national platform for their message to get global buy-in even, to get global buy-in for their message. They did not have that. They had to call newspapers and radio stations and see if they could actually organize a kind of quasi, you know, press conference where they were trying to do the thing. And now the, we have a whole generation of people who actually saw these social media platforms and said, we can organize ourselves, each other, an entire message of movement. Mm. That's what I mean by shaking it up with your unique perspective, your message, what you want to do with it. Mm. So we've seen a lot, as you say, a lot of um, social justice movements, um, you know, gaining a lot of support on social media but for ordinary people who specifically use the media to like relax because you also see a lot of you know jokes and people just having very casual conversation on social media um do you think they're aware of the potential their media platforms um have I don't know if they are aware or not, right? Like we all make decisions about how we want to interact with things that we enjoy. And at the end of the day, everyone is looking for some sort of way to escape Mm. into the media that we're Mm. interacting with, right? I think this is part of why it can be very disruptive Mm. for some people to think that the thing that they are enjoying the way that they are consuming something that is supposed to be an escape for them could possibly mean something and mean something that isn't so beneficial to them on a psycho spiritual level. Right. That was the, the way that I started getting a shake up in relation to the media that I was consuming. I wanted to go to the movie theater and escape like everyone else. Mm-hmm. But I'm sitting there watching a movie and the most horrendous stereotypes about black people and black women were coming through to me in this art form that I was supposed to be using as a form of escape. So eventually I got tired of that and it changed my entire relationship. I think that it's an individual thing. I think that a lot of people feel things 
but they don't have language around what they're feeling, Mm -hmm. right? And maybe they even have myth around what they're feeling because where facts are not present, myth a lot of times will fill in the gap. So they are maybe buying into a myth around the things. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, what, what some people who are just on there wanting to maybe just do call and response, you know, like, or just do a joke thread or things like that are seeing, maybe they're just into it for the popularity Mm. of the moment, right. To get a response from, uh, from the audience. But if people have actual goals around their voice and what they're doing, I think there's huge potential to Mm. tap into where media is concerned. And especially where Africans are concerned, such natural storytelling is within the lifeblood of so many Africans. Uh, Pretty much everyone that I've ever met have such a beautiful, just storytelling history within their own families, their lineage. And like you said at the beginning, there's so many times that instead of really owning the narrative, like having their own hero story be brought forth. Western society in particular, like on this part of the hemisphere, is always presenting Africa as some kind of pitiful child Mm -hmm. that needs to be parented or the gooey heart space Mm -hmm. that some, you know, heavily westernized person who has gotten away from the natural world is too citified or too corporatized or too you know, capitalistic goes back to the motherland and gets filled up with wonder Mm -hmm. and love and humanity and plunders it kind of the way that minerals and land and peoples and culture and gems were plundered and doesn't do any sacred reciprocity, gets filled up and goes back to their westernized life now more enlightened about the world and touched by these wonderful, you know, lives that served them with uh, a a new way to look at themselves Mm. and be more complete as a human being. Um, It's weird. You speak about imaging, right? So the Mm. images we consume, um, how, how that changed your life, how when you began to see the narrative or the framing of black women in um, movies, for instance, you know, how that did not resonate with you. Why do you think black people are still um, perceived or the imaging around black people and black culture is still very racially driven where black people are still seen as inferior or where whiteness um, is seen to represent success um, where our culture how we just are is still not put on the same level as as you know our white counterparts how beauty is seen as having a particular, you know, shape of a nose, um, you know, being lighter is still an advantage for most people. So why do you think there hasn't really been change, you know, in that space, in the framing of black identity in the media? I think that the change hasn't happened because most people don't want to see that the change is needed. And to go back to that point of people want to escape and assume that the things that they are really enjoying escaping into do not have negative connotation behind them, let alone were not devised from a negative standpoint. One of the things that I came to realize, and I actually co-founded a center for intersectional media and entertainment, CIME. We pronounce it CME because it's about advancing representation. I co-founded this center to do research and provide resources for people in the entertainment industry. And it came together because I met a woman named Nicole Haggard, 
who's a professor. She uh, teaches in the film, media, and social justice department at Mount St. Mary's. And she did all of her research on the intersections of race and gender and sexual racism in Hollywood. What Nicole did was very groundbreaking, and it was groundbreaking for me as well as my other co-founder, Munika Lay, because we had not seen someone take a look at a very particular time period within the United States and actually trace its continued impact within the media. And that particular time period was called the Production Code era. It was the Hayes Production Code. Now, this happened in the United States right on the the after the the real popularity of the eugenics movement, which America had a eugenics movement before Hitler came to power Hmm. in the United States is actually believed. There's a lot of um, evidence to believe that the Nazi regime studied racial segregation within the United States to figure out how to segregate the Jewish population. Hmm. Um, it's also known that in South Africa, they looked at racial segregation within the United States to figure out apartheid. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that had happened in the U S way back in the 1600s was something called the Bacon's rebellion. And within the Bacon's rebellion, it was the colony of Virginia. The colony of Virginia was upset over their governor and everybody of every race got together uh, to kill the native American population and also get rid of the governor. When the governor went back to England and said, look at what these colonists did. It was the enslaved people. It was the indentured servants. It was, which were mostly white bodied. Some were, you know, black body. It was the, you know, land uh, owning people, the settlers, Look at what they did. They ousted me. They decided to look at some Portuguese theory about race and say, let's actually start to carve people up into white and black. And all of a sudden, they started putting these terms in the legislature, in the law, and calling people white and black. There was no evidence of anybody European being called white before this people from Africa were not called black. They created the divide so that there would be a division. Mm. They created the divide so that people would not be able to get together and revolt very easily against oppressive regimes. So fast forward from the 1600s into the 1900s and the eugenics movement comes along and people in the United States love it. They uh, implement Jim Crow segregation, which is basically legalized segregation to uh, make sure that black people could not go in pools, could not be in the waters that ha- that were touching white people, could not urinate or defecate in the same bathroom as white bodied people, could not live in the same neighborhoods, could not have the same opportunities, would be completely separate even though their ancestors had built the nation and even though the current population was still being used for taxes and for workforce to support individual families, corporations, entire industrial uh, movements and everything else to just keep plundering its own people. Now I said all of that to say that it extended to segregation on screen as well. And that was what this production code did. This production code was put into place to have a set of rules around bodies and how bodies could be seen and what bodies could be next to certain bodies. So Mm -hmm. within the production code, they actually had a whole clause in there about how the black races and the white races could not be seen having sex with one another. It was anti-miscegenation because they did not want to even acknowledge too that uh, white, that, you know, white people and black people could have children, right? Mm -hmm. So just like in South Africa, a mixed race child was illegal. Mm -hmm. Well, in the United States on screen, it was illegal to show this. It was forbidden to show it. So a lot of these stereotypes that we are consuming still right now 
around how black bodies are portrayed on screen, how white bodies, how Asian bodies, all these different stereotypes around the body. When we're seeing things like The Help, uh, which is a, a, a movie that was about uh, maids, black maids back in the Jim Crow era in South Korea, right? Is that should have been a movie that was about the black women, but it's still somehow about the white women in the story. And the black women are seen to be serving a subservient. Well, one of the things that Nicole came across in her research, which she pulled from the Academy Awards library, one of the things that she came across was a memo from Southern owners of cinemas. And they said that they were not willing to show a movie in their movie theaters that had black people and white people on screen together, Mm. unless the Negroes were seen in a servile capacity to the whites. These are the types of things that the industry rolled over for, and they wanted to uh, uplift you know, the, these people's beliefs so that they could keep having their money, right? Mm-hmm. So they did, they acquiesced to whatever they needed to acquiesce to, to keep selling those movie tickets, even though it was a small, very small faction of the population. But the more that this kept being the way to go about doing things, to do business, to tell a story, to sell a script, to sell a book, to have a book turn into a film, the more it became the way of doing business. It became smart business. It became Mm. business as usual, not a thing that was grounded in eugenics ideology, segregation and Jim Crow, the most horrendous stereotypes around racial theory and the hierarchy of human beings, uh, and not something that's steeped in a very, in my opinion, spiritual dilemma mm. on a psycho-spiritual level. It is the antithesis to life, to humanity, to who we are supposed to be, to one another. Mm. It is not why we are here. It is the opposite of why we are here. And it is part of why I think there is so much uh, illness and discontent and fragmentation within the, within nations, families, nations, mm. you know, in world, everything, because we are not talking about this for what it is. And then we're sitting there in movie theaters or in our own living rooms, watching these things and having this come back into our mind and our body and our spirit as if it is nutrition Mm. and it is trash. And, and Joy, I love that you, you bring that up. I mean, we see this negative imaging of black people and black culture, um, you know, in media and we see how oftentimes either black people will, will, will be depicted in an inferior role, um, either as the help or the gardener, you know, the typical sort of scenarios. How do you think this constant imaging of inferiority has affected black people at a psycho-spiritual level over the years? I think that it's had a deep impact on us psycho-spiritually. It's had a, a, again, a fragmentation. It has created more levels in relation to our psycho-spiritual growth, right? Which you're going to have that if you are alive on earth, in a human body, having human experience, you are going to have a journey. I think these things create unnecessary layers around that journey, Mm. unnecessary barriers, ways that it makes it more difficult for you to look in the mirror and see divinity reflecting back to you within your own eyes. And that is what you are supposed to be seeing. So anything that is creating an unnecessary barrier, a a lie around that, I believe is incredibly detrimental. And we've seen it in things like 
the, the, here in the United States, uh, there was something called the Clark doll test. And the Clark doll test was a, a set of children, uh, black children. This was back in the fifties were shown baby dolls of varying shades from white to the black. And they were told to point to the baby doll that was the good baby doll mm. and then point to the baby doll that was the bad baby doll. And the black children who were like five, six, seven years old pointed to the white baby doll and said, that's the good baby. Goodness. And the black baby doll and said, that's the bad baby. They had already picked up from all of the stories in the air around them that they were the bad one. They were the inferior one. And a lot of this came in through the media. Now, they used the Clark Doll test as one of the things to uh, advocate for segregation in schools. But then in the late 60s, the 70s, there was a doctor named Dr. Chester Pierce, who was a psychologist, and he was looking at the media specifically, the news media's effect on black children. And he termed the term microaggression hmm. because he said that it was a psychological warfare, a psychological attack coming into the very living rooms of these black children with all of these negative messages about who they are, what who their com communities are, their people are, their families are, uh, without them even having to go outside. They didn't have to go anywhere to be found with this and attacked with it. So if you think about that and you're constantly being shown that you are the sidekick, you don't have a story worthy of being centered. You are there to be subservient. You are there to offer up everything. It's a, it's a recipe for becoming convinced that you are always supposed to be plundered and you will even plunder yourself. You mm. offer up all of your treasures to everyone else. And then you wonder how you end up empty. Mm. Well, you're thinking that that's the way it's supposed to be because you're not being seen. You're not seeing another story. You're not seeing another possibility for yourself. And we are so hardwired for story. I can go even deeper than this. I can actually talk about the, the neurochemistry behind this. We are, again, hardwired for story. And one of the things that happens when we are watching a story, when we're being told a story, cortisol is the first thing that kicks in. Hmm. That cortisol kicks in so that you focus your attention on the important person. Now, we, our bodies learn to do this because if you need to be paying attention to who the leader was, right? Who the tribal leader was, who the hero was, who the warrior is, who the enemy is, and you don't know how to identify that and focus your attention, you might end up dead, mm. right? Or in jail <laughs> or your whole family is destroyed. So it's rather brilliant that your body has a chemical to help you hone your attention. And then once that cortisol kicks in, the next thing is dopamine. And dopamine now has you vested in the outcome of this person. And then from the cortisol and the dopamine, oxytocin actually gets formed. That is the bonding hormone that mothers uh, produce when they are nursing their child at their breast, right? That siblings produce with one another when they are, you know, holding each other and mm -hmm. going to sleep in a bed, right? That fathers produce with their children. It's a natural bonding hormone you do with your best friend. It creates community. So think about this. If your cortisol and your dopamine has been trained to constantly look at white bodied hero protagonist centered stories. Your cortisol is not focused on the black sidekick and mm. what their outcome is going to be, or the person who shows up as the magical Negro to help them with a, whatever, and then gets killed after they help them. You're not trained on that. Your cortisol and your dopamine is focused on this white body character. And now you're creating oxytocin, a false bond with this, this 
character that is centered, and you're never seeing yourself centered. It's very interesting that you sh- you should speak about who the hero is, the constant imaging, right? Because I've been thinking about how that also affects our aspirations and how it affects how we consume. Yeah, so what what are the intersections between between what we see as great, as significant, that which we consider to be successful, you know, what we lean towards. Right. Well, on the real world plane that we have to operate within all the time, it is part of what we think is status, right? Mm. And we don't just seek status because status is nice and cool and is great to be popular, but we also see a certain level of safety and security within status. Mm. I think that we're, most of us are iffy about whether or not we're okay at any given moment. Like we know that we're not being chased by uh, tigers and bears and things like that all the time now. But there's these other things like Mm. racism and sexism and ageism (laughs) You know, mm-hmm. all these different classism, caste system things that are chasing us relentlessly like a predator, trying to cram us into things like a predator. And so when you s- see who is centered, who is popular, who's on the cover of the magazines, who's on the billboards, who gets a show, who gets a movie, who gets exalted to celebritum and is put in front of you as a beauty ideal uh, and they're they're thin, and they're young looking, as young looking as possible, and you know they're as, as white looking as possible all mm. the time. And it doesn't even sometimes matter what racial category they technically fall into; they still line up with those three things that I just said. Mm. You notice that that is what is status. You notice that that is what is successful. You notice that that is what, if you can get near that you might have a shot at being safe. And so it makes sense to me that a lot of people will take the most effervescent parts of themselves, cut it off, throw it in the gutter, right? And then they'll watch someone else come up and pick it up out of the gutter and put it on and make a billion dollars with it, Mm. right? Because we get convinced that who we intrinsically are is not good enough, it's not worthy, is not going to have status around it. If you want status, change uh, as much about yourself as possible so that you look like the people who are worthy of status, who are worthy of being safe. It makes your level of safety and security and your sense of belonging in the world very transactional Mm. when it's supposed to be relational. It makes it hierarchical when you're supposed to have network, right? And it gets you hyper-focused too on the solo aspect of your destiny as if you don't have shared destiny. Because in the United States in particular, we've been pushed into rugged individualism because that makes it easier to siphon everyone off, silo everyone off Mm -hmm. and have them ripe and ready to be consumed and distorted, right? And you can see the opposite of that is rugged collectivism. Neither one is real. We're supposed to have some sort of fluidity between the two. But when things become so rigid and traumatic and a trauma response, which is what rugged individualism is in the United States, is a trauma response it turns into this hyper individualism. If you were to sit down with a therapist and you were to tell them, I can't rely on anybody. Everything has just got to be me. I'm, I'm, I'm all alone. Uh, you know, I've got to do this all by myself. Your therapist, if they're a good therapist, would ask, what happened to you? Mm. They would want to get to the heart of what is going on with you that you feel so cut off and so isolated and so separated that you have no one else and nothing else, right? Uh, That's what we get pushed toward 
within the United States in particular is this rugged and ruggedly individualistic mindset where we have no one else to rely on. You are supposed to uh, be wary of your neighbor, uh, you know, get as many guns as possible, protect yourself within an inch of your life because you never know who's coming for you in the middle mm. of the night. Uh, there is no idea of community. Don't talk about ancestors because <laughs> that would make you have to look at history. Mm. Right. And have a conversation about things that you don't want to talk about because we're just supposed to forget and move on as if nothing is happening. And maybe, 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 maybe if you're lucky, you get the one romantic relationship and now you expect every single thing from your romantic partner where before you would have gotten a lot of those things from a community mm. aspect, not keep all of that responsibility on I'm just one, one human being, one mm. person. And when they fall short, as they inevitably will, because it is impossible, now you think that the love is a fail and you think everything is a lie. Right? And you think mm. that nothing is real uh, because you have to, you only have that one option of that one romantic relationship because you are so inevitably cosmically alone. Mm. It's all a lie. And it's like you, when you realize that everything around you is encouraging you to be fragmented the most radical form of self-love is to pursue integration. When mm. you realize that everything around you is encouraging you to be ruggedly individualistic, the most radical way that you can show yourself self-compassion is to seek a sense of belonging that does not compromise who you intrinsically are. Just have an effortless sense of belonging as a human being mm. to reclaim I these birthrights is part of how we heal, but we can't heal that if we're not even seeing the fragmentation because we're so convinced that the status symbols that we have been told are status symbols are the only way to go about living. And it can be really stressful for people to start to do decolonization work, anti-oppression work within mm -hmm. yourself. Because you start to realize that almost every level of everything you believe to be true about you, about your community, about your possibilities in the world, and about our possibilities together have been invaded by a marauder. Mm. In, in South Africa, I've observed how many young black people are so removed from, from themselves. So this imaging or the aspirations of success has also for many men consuming way beyond their means and having to live like such unsustainable lifestyles especially young women to obtain you know these aspirations of being beautiful of being wanted of being you know so one can almost see how what has been depicted as success also eats away at the core of people i'm really not sure what is it going to take to help people remember and to and to go inward to remember who they are because once you remember who you are you also get to understand that you are not alone, that there is that community and it doesn't have to be competition that you can own your greatness and show up in the world as such. I've seen over, you know, the past couple of years how black men in particular have been portrayed, uh, black American men have been portrayed in the media. You know, I'm seeing it in South Africa as well, where the rate of gender-based violence has also gone up um, quite drastically, where young men are also committing a lot of suicide. So I'm just like really interested to find out how you think these different or these two could relate to what we have come to to get to understand about black men, 
right? The imaging that we have continued to see over, over time about black men. Um, yeah. Well, that has a deep history within the media as well, right? Like there's news media and there's entertainment media. So of course, all media is not news, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but all news media is media. And one of the biggest exports that the United States has ever created is actually its media, its content. And all of the stereotypes and bias and psycho-spiritual issues that the country has had has been embedded in the media that it has exported. I believe that this is still true. It was true a couple of years ago that, that uh, about 78% of the media consumed globally is created in the United States. Hmm. So we, there's still one of the biggest drivers of what something is supposed to look like on screen, who, like, who is supposed to be centered in a story, what is supposed to be human. Right. And the black male body was portrayed with a lot of danger around it. Uh, this started with a, on screen with a really big movie here in the United States called The Birth of a Nation. At that time, some sort of way, the, the, the man who directed it, because this was the early 1900s, got a million dollars to make this sure. movie. Um, this was a, a, a huge freaking budget that he had. Um, and he was able to, uh, basically put this story on screen that glorified the Ku Klux Klan as the heroes of the South. So when you enter the story, there are white male actors in blackface. So they are painted to look black and they are in Congress eating watermelon and fried chicken with their feet up, you know, bare feet up and everything just taken over. And there was this really uh, important scene to where a black man professes his love to the white woman and wants to marry her. And her response is to run from him and throw herself off a cliff. So it's an instructional video <laughs> for white <laughs> women about how to respond to the, the danger. And, and the idea was that this was a rape on screen, right? And so I was actually talking with uh, Nicole about this yesterday th during the Jim Crow era when all of the lynchings were going on. There was this folklore pornography, if you will, within the news media where they were constantly talking about this black man who had uh, dangerously pursued and tried to rape this innocent white woman with rings of golden hair, like crown of golden hair around her. And when these lynchings would go on in the United States, I want to be clear. A lot of times on the, in the movies that they do show it, they show like five people, maybe mm. this would be 500 people, 1500 people. Mm. In some cases, 15,000 people would show up, bring their whole family, take pictures with the lynched black man, mm -hmm. cut him up, take home pieces of his body as trophies and reminders of the danger. Mm -hmm. They would sing hymnals mm -hmm. at these lynchings hymnals as if God was endorsing this and uplifting this because this is the story. This is the myth that was being perpetuated within the media, within all of the, the, the newspapers that becomes the conversation as people are sitting there having lunch with each other, having their coffee talking at the dinner table, talking after church, right? 
very pervasive and invasive. My point of all of this is not to bring forward the horror, even though it is horrifying. It is to show how embedded this mythology is, how vested people got in this mythology being true, and how it has been fed, it has been nurtured, it has been monetized, it has stakeholders and it has shareholders that have been worked up and gathered together and suckling from the teat of it for centuries at this point. There, it's not a coincidence that we have gotten to where we've gotten to. It's not a coincidence that the black male body is being hunted the way that it's being hunted or that the black female body is being hunted the way that it's being hunted. It is not a coincidence. We are not crabs in a barrel. And even the barrel isn't the actual thing to look at. The real culprit is the hand that has crammed the crabs into the barrel so that they can be in a form of communal horror and be more easily, readily available to be consumed. Hmm. And this is not nebulous. It has been uh, methodical for a lot of people who really wanted to uh, seize the power of it and make money themselves, uh, create power themselves, get political gain, right? Like mm-hmm. get, uh, get corporate gain uh, because it's a way too, if you, if you have a certain viewpoint that is a strong stance, for example, in the United States is so much about like, how do you feel about crime? Right. Mm. And crime is codified, it's coded. It, it has, it's a signifier. When they say crime, they mean They're black people. Black people. Mm. Right. They're not talking about, uh, all the Wall Street people that, uh, destroyed entire neighborhoods with the way that they played with money. They mean the, the black marauder, the black rapist, the one who's going to come for your golden ring of hair daughter, what, how, how I feel about crime. And so it's a whole trope. There's a, there's an energy that's a flow of media, right? That is a, that is a story line that has an energy, a current of energy flowing within it. And all they have to do to gain some sort of power, some sort of clout is redirect that stream of energy into their image, their brand, their story, how they are showing up in the world. And it becomes an opportunity to actually gain something. So that's, that's why I say like, when you can look at the media and see what it is, how it operates, how a story goes from nothing to everything Mm. and what stories get lifted and which ones don't. And who gets celebrated and who is supposed to be cured or culled? That's when you start to really find out what is going on with fact as well as myth, what people are vested in, what Mm. they are willing to compromise about themselves and what they want to get on board with or what they have to, you know, strip away from themselves to get on board with Mm. so that they can have a sense of status. I want to speak about contribution. So globally, in the United States of America, in South Africa, black people have contributed to defining freedom. You know, we have fought for so many rights. We have contributed to so many policies, things that were not even ideas not so many years ago. But that is like not celebrated. Um, that is not spoken about. So not only in terms of, uh, pop culture, I think where pop culture is concerned, there is a lot of, um, information. There's a lot of, uh, content. But when it comes to real things and important things, such as freedom, we barely hear how black people have contributed, you know, to such significant um, advances in society, right? 
What has been your observation around um, those type of issues? Because in South Africa, I mean, we, we there's there's no content around or very little content around what our struggle heroes fought for, what um, black people have had to fight for, you know, the liberties that we now have, where it all comes from. It's not really celebrated. Um, well, we're, we're in a precarious position here in the United States because we have a lot of politicians right now who want to erase the history. We have uh, politicians that are fighting against with something called critical race theory. Mm-hmm. And they've, they've taken the narrative of that and they've distorted it within the media. Uh, which, I mean, again, distortion of a narrative that is in cooptation of a message. That's a war strategy. That's war strategy communications. So they have done that, um, to make critical race theory something dangerous. And critical race theory is something that started from looking at the law, mm-hmm. looking at legality around the body and around black bodies in particular to see how racism and racist ideals and uh, ideals of separation and segregation were embedded in the law. And then people within different uh, areas, such as education, media, and things like that have taken that basis of critical race theory as a rubric, as a framework to look at how those same ideals perpetuated themselves into different primary social institutions Mm -hmm. uh, within the country. And so right now we have a lot of politicians who are doing things. You you might hear people saying that they're anti-woke, right? Mm -hmm. Which is another term that has been co-opted. We know that woke really started within the black community Mm -hmm. as a way to talk about awakening and healing, right? To become aware of the conditions and the causes around things and have vocabulary around it and be able to talk about what that path toward liberation looks like, right? Mm -hmm. What that anti-oppression work looks like. But now that's been co-opted. And so we have politicians currently that are running on a platform of, I'm the anti-woke candidate. I'm going Mm -hmm. to keep this history uh, out of the out of the school books. They don't want to call people enslaved anymore. They don't want to talk about the enslaved population mm. that built the country. They call them workers mm. or the unpaid workers, the unpaid workers. <laughs> that that's a, mm, that's some gymnastics right there. Mm. Right. So the unpaid workers, uh, we just had Martin Luther King day and People who have voted against black history being taught in schools put up Martin Luther King Jr. quotes, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quotes on MLK Day, right? Hmm. They don't talk about the fact that he was anti-imperialism. They don't talk about his theories on reparations, right? So actually monetary reparations to the black community They don't talk about how he felt about labor and labor rights and that he was a union guy. They don't, they don't talk about that. They don't talk about the union aspect uh, of his story. They just talk about the dream, Mm -hmm. right? I had a dream and they, they talk about that and, and his uh, civil unrest, his nonviolent civil unrest, right? His, his, a philosophy of nonviolent protest and they don't talk about the meat and the heart. I, and I don't expect them to, why would they? I mean, let's be real about something. Why would they? Mm. I have never seen a moment in history where people who had a s- extreme advantage over others politically, economically, that were benefiting from oppression of others, sit down one day and say, or stand up one day and say, you know what? (laughs) Yeah. We 
should change all of this. We should make things more equitable. There is no point in history where that has just happened. So if these stories are going to be expanded, if they're going to be talked about, the people who are not getting the stories told correctly are going to have to be the storytellers. That is the only way that it is going to change. And we need to not just look at, oh, the storytellers need to become the storytellers, but they also need to become the distributors. Mm. They also need to become the owners. There needs to be spaces and places of information and sharing that are not beholden to a group of shareholders board members, founders who do not look like the group that needs their story centered and have no vested interest in making things better. That is how things start to change is for people to take their power back to own Mm -hmm. their narrative and the flow of that information uh, Mm -hmm. and be able to do it in a way that is permissionless. When you don't have permissionless leverage, then that means you have to get buy-in. And if it's going to be difficult for you to get buy-in from people because they have no, no real motivation to change anything, then how is change going to happen? So one of the reasons why I love writing, for example, and publishing and self-publishing in particular is because it's permissionless Mm. at any given moment. And sit down. Even if I don't have a laptop or a phone with me, I can just have a pen and a piece of paper and start to put things into motion in relation to a story, something that I want to say, something that I want to share, something that I feel compelled to put into the world. And we right now have no social media platforms really to be able to use that are not owned by, don't trickle up to essentially the same six to seven white men who are Mm. chairmen of those boards. So I know we've talked a lot about what is the media that you are consuming and to ask yourself about those stories. Like, oh, what are the stories that I'm being told? But I think it's also important to ask who owns the media that you consume? Who owns it? As I'm thinking about this, I'm I'm wondering if black people who own production houses are deliberate in the kind of content or stories they tell. I've personally watched a lot of movies with an all black cast that essentially tell the same story. You know, young couple grow up, become successful, the guy, you know, the same pattern basically exists in these uh, stories. But nothing or very little around the rich history that we have. I mean, one movie that comes to mind right now that depicts a lot of what happened when black people were enslaved is uh, 12 Years a Slave. Why are we not seeing more of those rich stories? Is it because they might not sell? Is it because people want to forget? Is it, why, why is it? And it's not necessarily only stories around uh, slavery, right? There are other things we can tell about black people, Africans. We are such amazing creators. We are creative, um, you know, our, our history, our culture is so rich. Our traditions are so rich, but we are not seeing much of that content. Why do you think that is? I think that part of it is, again, the ownership aspect. It, okay, you can own a production house, but who owns the distribution? Because it's one thing to create the content, but you still have to get it distributed, right? Like, just like if you write a book and you go to a publishing house to publish it, the publisher becomes the distributor of the book. How are they going to market you 
as an author? How are they going to market the book that you wrote, right? Are they going to put it in a small bucket or a large bucket? Are they just going to slap black author on you, right? And now you're on the black shelf in the bookstore. Uh, so a, a lot of it is still boiling down to distribution. And yeah, there are uh, black auteurs who own production studios, but we don't have a lot of ownership where, where distribution companies are concerned. Uh, we don't have a lot of ownership where channels, platforms are concerned. We don't own the Netflix situations or, you know, Amazon, Amazon Prime and things of that nature. So there is still a permission aspect to getting a green light and getting funding because movies cost a lot of money and they just keep mm -hmm. costing more money. They just keep costing more money. So if we are constantly thinking about things from the top down, it's really expensive and it gets really hard <laughs> to, to, to mm -hmm. get anything accomplished because now you have to have so many millions and billions of dollars to make anything happen. And you actually have, you know, oppression uh, to access. So mm -hmm. with lack of access, how are you going to get those funds that are needed? Uh, you'd have to have a lot of celebrity buy-in and things like that. And, uh, you know, everybody talks about like, oh, Oprah is a billionaire, but Oprah is a very small billionaire. Um, in, mm. if Oprah in the biggest scheme of things, yeah. You know, but right, like she doesn't have a lot of billions compared to the Koch brothers, you know, who d d distribute toilet paper and stuff like that. And each one of them is worth like tens of billions of dollars each, almost a hundred billion dollars each. Um, that's a very different type of monetary conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I like to go smaller with things sometimes cuz sometimes really big ideas, big changes start with small incremental changes. We don't always need big ideas. Sometimes we need Absolutely. small ideas. Mm -hmm. And the small ideas are start with intellectual property. Own your intellectual property. Uh, we don't have to always have things in script form for it to get popular and get seen out into the world. Maybe start with a book. Start with a short story, <laughs> you know, just mm -hmm. own that IP some sort of way. Get audience and uh, buy in from readers and things like that, a, a loyal following around that small thing. Start with a podcast, right? Build up a listenership with that. Mm. Get that kind of buy-in from the community of listeners, of, of people who are going to be loyal supporters. Start with a short film version. There are so many movies I can show you that they got a, a, a big movie deal and a distribution deal because they started as a little tiny 10-minute short film mm that they were able to go around the festivals with, it did well, that's so much less money, right? So if you can get the idea digestible into a short film and get that out there and build following around that, there are even platforms now like the Pause TV that help you launch your short independent film and get money back, like actually have people tip you after watching it so you can recoup your uh, production expenses and things of that nature. Or maybe it's even easier to find an investor, find a backer, a financial backer for something that's only going to cost $15,000 to do versus something that's going to cost $15 million to do. Mm -hmm. And you build up from there. Uh, look at talent bring like talent that we want to make bankable like this is uh, when we say the word bankable that's a term within the industry that means that this is someone that if you get them on your cast you now will get a green light for your project mm. that's how strong their name is right so like julia roberts is a bankable name right like viola mm. davis is a bankable name and so if you get viola davis to come on board your film boom your film is now bankable well viola davis got bankable became bankable because she kept doing work and getting seen and building audience around herself as an actor yeah. so you see talent and now 
do the short film so that the talent has a really great short film to be involved in. And that's going to make them more bankable as an actor. That's going to make you more bankable as a storyteller, as a director, as whatever. If we start to think about these smaller ways, instead of, oh, goodness, why isn't this story getting told from the top down? Why isn't it getting told Mm. on this major level? Well, maybe start with the short Ter mm. version or the or the 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 less permission driven version of getting the story but, out there. Yeah, but I also think, um, especially where young people are concerned, instant gratification or like wanting to see the results now, you know, wanting the fame now, wanting it big now, is also a barrier to getting people to start doing things, you know, and one can understand where that comes from. Um, psychosocial understanding to say black people have been deprived for so long. Uh, people don't want any association with poverty, with, with lack. And so they just want to see the results tomorrow and don't really have the patience to take the longer route. Right. Um, so I totally get that. However, I want to briefly speak about how, because African traditions or African spirituality, I mean, I haven't been to the United States, but from what I've seen, from what I've read, your ancestors belief system, you know, their belief in God kept them going, right? It kept them going. They believe in love because there's also a lot of love in black culture, uh, in black history, kept them going. I see how in South Africa, because Christianity and missionary schools were brought on and were used in very specific ways to to teach people that any form of African traditional spirituality was primitive and barbaric and, and all and evil. How black people stopped practicing their spirituality, how they got disconnected with who they were. How do you think that has affected black people and how they see themselves? and their ability to connect with each other, uh, not only in their personal lives, but also what we show in the media, right? So the kind of stories that, that we tell, especially around that. Well, I, I think with in the diaspora, it's, it's different depending on what your relationship was to imperialism and colonization, Right. Because some were enslaved, others were colonized and made illegal in their Mm. own country, right? Um, Some were enslaved in a way that they were never intended to make it. Their bodies were literally broken. While others were brought over for a while until, like in the United States, it became illegal and unnecessary to keep shipping people over when you could just go into the slave quarters and create your own supply, right? Mm. So it it became <laughs> an issue of being bred. It's so layered and insidious and sick and weird and uh, inhuman in so many ways. I, 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 it makes sense to me that throughout the diaspora, a lot of times the black peoples have met themselves with harshness. Mm. We're very rough with one another and ourselves and ourselves. Mm. And I think that it's related to a lot of what you talked about, you know, before too of we, we feel like we have enough poverty narrative because of the way that a lot of times black bodies have been depicted within media. So Mm. we want to show the prosperity narrative and the world is also becoming very anti-victim, right? Victim is a slander now. This Mm. is is a, it's a curse word. (laughs) There's profanity behind victim because you are supposed to be the victor. 
And if you're a victim, then that means there's kind of something wrong with you. Do you have victim mentality? You mm. know, you know, like, are you, did, why are you a victim? What, what was wrong with you? What happened to you that you were caught slipping, right? Like, why mm. were you uh, prone to being a victim? And if that's all that we're looking for, you're going to miss some of the richness, right, of opportunity to tell really nuanced, uh, deeper stories. So much of it just, again, has to boil down to love, but self-love. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk a lot about radical self-love because it is a gateway. It It opens you back up to what has always been existing inside of you. You don't have to actually go search for it. The promised land is within you. So I kind of feel like when you start to look for that voice externally, that's within the media, within society telling you, this is how you make it to the promised land. That's when you know that you're off the grid for yourself. You know, you're off the road map because the promised land is within you. I personally like to go to nature. Mm. I feel so deeply rooted within myself when I give myself some sort of reinforcement of the fact that I am a natural creature. I am a form of life itself. Nothing that is living is alien to me, Mm. you know, and it opens me back up to this seamless realm within me where the beauty has always existed. And I want to be clear. I'm talking about beauty. I'm not talking about the glamour. I'm not talking about Mm. your nails being perfect. Okay. (laughs) And your hair being laid (laughs) and you wearing the designer labels that Mm. make you feel like you have the right status and you're showing up in the world in that way. I mean, the, the beauty within yourself of being in this body and this body being a companion and you being a companion to your body, you being in partnership with this vessel and this vessel being a bridge and being a portal to your truth, to your eternal and a way for you to take this vast energy that is all things, that is everything that existed before the sun and the stars and the moon and everything and give it really specific, beautiful coordinates in space and time. I don't know really how to talk about the diaspora getting to that place, Mm. but I believe that the diaspora has always known it. I think that that is the ancestral science. I almost said ancestral wisdom, but I want to be clear. The (laughs) wisdom is rooted in science and observation, (laughs) Right? In trial and error, it's not like the wind whispered it to the ancestors. They observed the world and turned that into science. And okay, yeah, so like these other systems have come around to call it wisdom. And it is wisdom, but it's also science that was rooted in observation, in truth, in the facts, in the facts that we then took those facts and tried to tell it as myth, right? So that it would be easily potable to one another, be able to transmit it to one another. And if that is what the diaspora can get back to, then I think that everything else starts to follow suit because that is where the inner peace is rooted of being at home within yourself, forgiving yourself of the things that you didn't realize before, right? Not being an enemy to you, not thinking that you are against you, that you have to control yourself, that you have to be at some sort of warfare conflict within, but to actually start to ask questions of how can I have an epic romance with my nervous system? How can I Um, be a companion to mm -hmm. the epigenetic resilience 
and courage and love that is existing within me, not just the trauma. If your ancestors can pass trauma, then they can also pass love the good and courage, mm-hmm. right? Right. So where, how do you get back to that? And mm-hmm. remember that again, you are alive. You are natural. Nothing living is alien to you. You have every right to be here. And these things, all these isms that have been brought into this world to create barriers, an alternate reality, a force field, invisible force field around your body to try to make it more difficult for you to self-realize, self-actualize, (laughs) self-determine is a lie. And so it kind of begins with your, your courage. And your creativity, your imagination, your beauty, and your divine spark of defiance. And for you to keep leaning into that defiance against that invisible force field, against that alternate reality, and Mm -hmm. to actually buy into your reality, which you know to be true, through this companion, this vessel, this bridge that is your body that's giving you these unique coordinates in space and time so that you can have your unique human experience and claim it. And yeah, claim I'm it. getting very, very emotional as um, you're talking about this because I think, you know, loving yourself as a black person is one of the fundamental things Martin Luther spoke about or try to teach because when you love yourself you will invest in your dreams you will be the best that you can be you will show up and it's not only Martin Luther King but Steve Biko here in South Africa taught about black consciousness so having that self-love and love for your community And that's why they died, because they were just simply reminding us about the power that we possess if we were to tap into who we truly are. And I don't know what it's going to take to help young black people remember um, who they are, to remember the stories of their ancestors, So they can retell the stories, right? And so we can be the great kings and queens that we are. Um, Yeah, it it gets me very emotional um, thinking about it because so much rests on our ability to remember you know, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the recollection is part of the reclamation, right? And you don't have to, of course, you don't have to be the keeper of the flame. You don't have to be the historian of hidden history. You don't have to be any of those things, mm-hmm. it, especially when it, it starts to feel so painful at first. You know, I know when I started to really look at history for what it is, it was painful. It was traumatic. But the question became, how was I going to turn those wounds into wisdom? Mm -hmm. What was I going to gather from that? And honestly, I think that it starts with things like your podcast, right? With the writers that we have now with the, the singers, with the people who are examples of that love and radiating that love. We know that vibrationally, that is the highest vibration, right? Like that is the energy that is the true galvanizing, changing energy. And I think that even, I know where Black Americans are concerned, the ancestors knew that. When they would arrive off of the ships and someone had not made it across that horrible oceanic trip, they would sing around the body, right? And if you think about it, if you had a a grandmother or a mom or an auntie or someone like that who knew how to hold you at her bosom and rock 
and hum, right? Think about that hum. Think about it as you were rocking in that. That hum, it had this healing vibration within it. I felt so safe and so sacred within my grandmother's hum whenever she would hold me and rock me like that. It vibrated from her body into my whole being. That doesn't feel like a coincidence. That doesn't feel like Mm. that's just, you know, some kind of weird kooky thing that happens. Feels like science. And while maybe some things might call it pseudoscience, it feels like something that she knew to be a way to transmit that love to me in the touch, in the hum, in the sound, right? Which we know the universe began with a sound, Mm. right? So there was all of that mixed together. And I think that this has never been in history a more important time than right now for those who work in words, for those who are willing to create space and create sacred social containers for that healing. There's a a mystical aspect to this work. It is emancipatory. It is liberation work, right? It is abolition work. <laughs> it yeah, is. I was saying that the freedom. other day that yeah. this is an act of defiance. You know, um, fighting to tell our stories, fighting for our people to heal is an act, is a political statement on its own because it cuts across the work cuts across so many different areas of our society whether it be how we tell the stories which stories do we tell are we deliberate in our efforts to tell the story because as i said i believe so much depends on us waking up I could go on and on and on and on, Joy. Um, but most of us have got access to a smartphone, right? Mm-hmm. Meaning we've got power, whether we see it or not. We can use our voice one way or the other. What would you say to young black people about the power they have in Mm. telling their stories and perhaps reframing the narrative around being black, being African? I would say that fear and anxiety and a deep disconnected feeling from yourself actually is not your normal resting state of being. It happens when you don't see, recognize, or revere your own power. So if you want that fear to dissipate, never doubt your magic. Never Mm -hmm. doubt your power. And also be understanding towards yourself that Exercising your power doesn't have to mean that you become as famous as Beyonce Mm. or as rich as Oprah. You know, you can define your success within your own self image. And that is part of where it begins, where you start to actually think about what do you want? What do you believe in? What do you feel called? to do? What do you feel compelled to do? What lights you up when you start to do it? When you think about it, where, where does everything just tingle, right? Within all of your nerves. And then as you start to set out to do that thing, remember that belonging is your birthright. Benevolent community is your birthright. You don't have to do things alone. And part of what this technology that we have now in these devices helps us do is find people around the world who are in alignment 
with where you're going and what you want to do, just like we're on this podcast right now. Mm -hmm. And we're on two different sides of the globe, but we found each other (laughs) through Twitter, Mm. right? Mm. So if you are even having a hard time finding it within your immediate arm's length reach around you, now with this technology, you can go online and you can find it in other parts of the world, other parts of your own country, other parts of your own, you know, continent. You're not just stuck with these geographic locations that you're in, you know. So believe mm. and build incrementally so that you can be and become and belong. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. A much needed one. I wish we had more time, but I'm sure in the future we'll have lots of time to talk about things that affect us as black people. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, especially when we do something in person, because I know something in person is coming. So either you're going to be here in the States or I'm going to be there. (laughs) I believe so. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. I truly hope you learned something new, felt something, and were inspired to cultivate a more conscious life. I'd love to connect with you, hear your thoughts and story. Please feel free to reach out. Our contact details can be found on montsem.co.za. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.